what are the key lessons of portfolios of the poor in terms of poor people's financial behaviour? The most obvious outcome, the most obvious lesson is that poor people, even in the absence of microfinance organisations, tend to have complex and intensive financial lives. And uh, we were able, by talking to them at length through these series of interviews, to get some understanding of why that is the case. And if I can put that in a very simple framework, it is simply because if you are living, trying to live on an income that is not only small, but is also irregular and probably unreliable, and where you find that much of your income is in any case going on just the basics of life, largely food and the fuel to cook it with, then very often, perhaps more often than non-poor people, you're faced with the fact that when you want to buy anything else, the money simply isn't there. So when you want to deal with some life cycle event that's taking place in your life, when, when childbirth occurs, when you want to marry your daughter, educate your children, improve your house, and so on, if you're faced with an emergency, and very often if you just want to get life-enhancing assets like a fan or a bicycle and so on, the money simply isn't there. So we all know that if uh, you cannot fund these kinds of purchases, fund these kinds of expenditures out of current income, then either you go without or you have to sell off assets, other assets, which simply lengthens the lists of things you still need to buy, or and this is the only really sustainable way of doing it, you need to be able to dig into past income for current expenditure, or you need to dig into future income for current expenditure. And that is why poor people spend so much time and energy in looking for ways of doing those two tricks. Spending now out of past income, which requires savings, or spending now out of future income which means getting some kind of advance against that future income, in other words, a loan. So we found that uh, people, uh, poor people generally in all three countries, um, another of the lessons is that the, although the details of exactly how they do it vary, the principles, the general behavior is pretty consistent across all three countries, Bangladesh, India, and South Africa. We found that people do have rich, financial lives, intensive financial lives, whether in the presence or in the absence of microfinance institutions, they still subject a really rather large proportion of their total income to manipulation through financial devices in some way or another. What I mean by that is that if they have an income of 5,000 a year, they're putting something like three or 4,000 into and out of uh, savings devices or they're putting sums of that sort through borrowing devices. In other words, uh, they are not living hand to mouth. They are constantly looking for ways of manipulating their money in order not only to make sure that they have food on the table every day and not just on those days when income comes in, but to make sure that they can handle emergencies when they come along and to make sure that they can handle the larger life cycle expenditure needs that occur to all of us, whether we're rich or poor. Does that mean that poor people can actually save? Certainly. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the features of the research that we did in those three countries is to find a wide range of different kinds of savings mechanisms. Most of them in the informal sector. Everybody, in fact, every single household that we looked at in Bangladesh and in India and in South Africa was saving in one form or another. Virtually all of them were finding some way or other of saving at home, which might be to have a little clay piggy bank, or it might be to slot banknotes inside a piece of bamboo, or it might be to put it under the mattress and so on. So people were engaging in individual acts of saving. They were also engaging in group acts of saving. In every single country, we found plentiful examples of the various kinds of savings clubs and savings and loan clubs that are around that allow people to pool savings with others and then either withdraw or take loans from the fund as it builds up. 
And we found plenty of savings instruments that depend on a one-to-one relationship between two people. Saving with other people, uh, savings at banks if they're available, saving at microfinance institutions if they're available, saving with each other, using what we call money guards, some person whom you trust in your neighborhood. Uh, It may be a senior relative, it may be a trusted shopkeeper, it may be your employer, anyone with whom you can place a little bit of money so that you have some money in reserve when you need it. So yes, the instinct to save, as somebody once said, I think comes with us at birth. It's one of those fundamental pieces of um, human behavior that we find in every culture at every level of income. And uh, it's certainly the case that the poor are as conscious of it and strive to do it as much as anybody else. 